thank you very much for inviting me. I thought I would start from the beginning and say what AI can do for education. Um, let's see. And uh, try, bring a few examples in, especially of the work that we're doing now. So, this is what uh, we all think of the normal, typical education. But I say that digital learning is different. So when students start using the digital systems, and they come into your classroom and are using these uh, you know, laptops and tablets, the traditional learning goes away and they prefer the digital learning. And usually that means conventional speed goes, changes to twitch speed. Everything is really fast. Linear processing, and now they go to parallel processing. Everything used to be text-based in the old world, and now it's graphics and multimedia. It used to be standalone, and now the kids are all talking to each other. And it used to be passive, and now it's active. And then now it's going to be reality and fantasy. And no wonder students are bored in school, because school still looks like this model. And what kids have after school is that model. So the ch child's experience outside of school, information is instantly available. You know that if you have children around. Change is constant and rapid. And they're constantly using systems like this. Distance and time don't seem to matter. They can go across and get information from the internet. Powerful tools are taken for granted because that's what kids have. Multimedia entertainment is omnipresent. And people multitask, though they do it not effectively. And I'm, of course, talking about privileged countries. There are many countries where this is not the case, where what you do in school is the best you're going to get. And some kids, as we heard from the X Prize, uh, don't have any schooling at all. But in the United States, students are still bored in school. And our educational system is failing. Not enough people to replace existing workers in STEM. 33% of students will not graduate from high school in four years. 21st century skills are not being taught. Problem solving, dynamic thinking. And technology is not fully integrated and teachers and schools lack resources. So I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir. Everybody knows these things. I just thought I'd mention it. So what I'm gonna talk about is intelligent tutors, that is using AI in education, and I'm going to show you two experiments that we've worked on. And then I'm going to talk about big data for education and some of the perils of using AI for education. Even though the previous speaker, I think, said big data doesn't apply in education. I think it applies tremendously. This is, the, uh, this is to define AI in education. It is software that uses AI technology, machine learning, natural language processing to provide real-time personalized feedback to students. I don't know if some people want to disagree with that, but it seems to work. And it detects whether a student's reaction to a concept follows a pattern of misunderstanding and might have some information missing, and then the system can turn around and provide that information. And it can provide early warnings to teachers, et cetera. It, so it, AI in education can provide personalized learning, and I'll try to explain how that's done. Real-time performance tracking, in other words, instead of waiting till the end of the semester or the end of the chapter to give a one course, a one exam grade, these systems now can give results every second that the student is using the system. You know, he was being careless now, or he answered quickly, or he ran on to the next problem, or he's actually got solved it on first and he's really got it. So evaluation is not now teach and then stop all teaching and evaluate, but it's rather evaluate all the time while someone's online. And digital learning has the ability to change and customize learning content to suit the needs of the learner. This happens to be a first humanoid robot to be adopted in, Chinese, in Japanese homes. And there are many other such systems that are being adopted. Now these are some actual results, and the results are from Kulik and Fletcher, and it's very recent which is that the conventional teaching, that is the classroom and the teacher, with the exception of the great speaker we had here, Brian, we don't have to put him in this class, but mostly the average grade, as you can see, is around a C. And then mastery learning, and I won't go into that, is something else, but one-on-one -on -one tutoring moves, can move a child up to two sigma. So if you have a whole class where they're getting a spread like that, a distribution of grades that is all around C, you can move them up to everyone getting a B plus or an A just by having one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And it turns out that artificial intelligence used in education now can do the same thing, can move everybody up to two sigma improvement. I don't know if you've heard that because it hasn't actually happened until recently. So they, uh, it moves you from 
0.66 standard deviations over conventional levels or from what would be approximately a C grade to a B grade. These studies were carried out in nine different countries on four continents, and they show all the same I improvement. Uh, and and if, it, if the ro AI-enabled robots can help teach, then educators can focus on more complex topics and move ahead and deal with important problems. So I'm going to talk about one intelligent tutor built at UMass and WPI. It is intelligent, and I can explain how it's intelligent. Right now it has multiple choice, but that has been changed already to um, students can input small, short answer questions and those can be evaluated. But here's the problem, and then there's a little character here that can speak to the student and talk with them, and this is meant for fifth, A grades five through 12, and the, system, the student can go and get this problem, will be read to them, they can ask for hints, et cetera, they can look at examples, look at videos, et cetera. And every examination of this uh, shows that these systems improve learning, and they improve it to a, almost what we saw before. And the system has a lot of characters that are multicultural, that are female, uh, gender, uh, multigender, and it's a good vehicle for stu sending messages. So let me just show you quickly what kind of things we've done just to see where the technology is going. We are looking at the emotion of the student. So when a student is solving math problems, what should the tutor do in the moment when the students are frustrated or bored? I'm not going to go into details, but we used to bring in sensors into the classroom and detect through a vision sensor and through seats in the chairs to see what emotion a child had. Like if you're learning and turning away and you, or your head is down and you're frowning, we think you're frustrated or, we're not, or you're not engaged. But what we don't know is, so we can detect emotion, and several groups are doing that. I can tell you where WPI is one, and, uh, and others are doing that. But what should the system do? Should it increase the challenge, decrease the challenge, provide effective scaffolds, suggest peer-to-peer -peer collaboration? How do you measure the changes in students' affect and capture these changes, and then provide some kind of intervention? And so what we did was to study and put in sentences that look a little bit like this. Did you know that when we learn, something in our brain actually changes? It forms new connections inside that help us solve problems. So we call that, it's actually from Carol Dweck, and it's called Mastery Growth Learning. And we have about 50 such comments that the system makes to the student. We found positive results with that, with putting in those messages. And students who believe that intelligence can be increased tend to seek out academic challenges. And there's another person who also does this kind of work. And what we found is that low confidence can diminish success, et cetera. And Goldman talks a lot about emotional intelligence, et cetera. But let me show you. These are the three types of sentences we put in. One was growth mindset, what I just talked about. Did you know when we practice our skills, our brain grows and gets stronger? We also put in these sentences. Don't you sometimes get frustrated? I know I do. Then there are these typical sentences that a lot of systems have. Very good, we got another one right. Turns out when students see this, they get anxious, they turn off, they get disengaged. When they see these kind of sentences, they improve and their statement about their interest in math actually goes up. So that's in summary. And it, what's interesting from that study was if you receive these success failure messages, they make more mistakes and they seemed to be less learning oriented and said they were more confused when they heard, yes, this is right, no, this is wrong. So the next study we did was to look at co um, collaboration. Specifically, we looked at peer-to-peer, -peer, that is, you're sitting next to someone and you're each working on your system, and then we asked people to turn around and work with your partner, peer-to-peer, face-to-face collaboration with a neighboring student. And we found that after they worked on collaboration, it increases their interest because, oh, I didn't tell you, we give them an evaluation before and at the end and actually during and ask them whether they're interested now, whether they're bored, whether they're frustrated. So it turns out when they start working with a peer, they increase their own interest. They respond to students, it responds to students' negative affects, so that goes away. Some of the being frustrated goes away. It provides a boost in student math learning and it yields higher math performance and learning. So a lot of groups of people who are working with AI and intelligence are now doing these micromanagement kind of studies to actually figure out what's the impact of everything that the system is doing. And by the way, the AI is actually modeling these students. It's 
walk, working on figuring out exactly what skills they have, what knowledge they have, and whether they, each of these activities that we provide are, is improving that action. And let me go on. This is how we did it, which is that one student who's on the left said, gets a screen that says, the next activity is special. You will work with Wendy on one problem. And your job is to use the mouse and keyboard and work together. And then Wendy, the other person, says, in this next problem, you will work with Amy and on Amy's screen. And Amy will use the mouse. And your job is to read the problem, et cetera. We gave them each jobs. And then this person was asked whether they wanted to collaborate. Then this computer knows that this person, say, is in the middle of working on a problem. So it says to this person, do you want to wait until this person is finished? And then it waits and goes on. So in other words, this computer helps to coordinate the two people who are collaborating. Conclusions, we found a methodology to analyze how peer-to-peer -peer collaboration produces changes in the student's affective state. And it's not necessary how we do it, but there's Bayesian models and things like that. And evidence that offering collaboration can lead towards increased interest and excitement. OK. So um, one issue I want to bring up is that these things are not likely to be done in a classroom because a teacher who's responsible for 30 students can't really easily work on collaboration amongst the students and can't easily, cannot easily say, OK, this guy's really frustrated. He's banging his head on the table. I want to do something. But what can a, student, a teacher do when you have 30 other people and 20 maybe banging their heads, et cetera? So these are especially helpful for teachers as an aid. If, you're t if this system is helping the teacher, it's looking for these items, then the teacher can go on and do other things with the rest of the students. So I'm going to talk, those are just two, two examples of what kind of research is being done with AI. Then I'm going to talk now about big data in education and show you the kind of data that we're talking about. And then I'll talk a little bit about the ethics of AI in education and the issues that we have that we have to look out for. So why is big data useful? And does anyone know what big data in, in education looks like? Any, anyone? You must know. Someone, someone here told me they work on data analysis at Macmillan. They know what it looks like. OK, I'll, I'll show you. So uh, what it, we found is that big data addresses deep and varied challenges. It helps us find education's wicked problems. In other words, there are definite performance gaps. We've heard this before, that produce cycles of unachievement underachievement and, ra and cultural racial differences? Can we detect who has these issues and why? Can we identify children with similar learning difficulties? And can we find successful strategies and gender differences? And um, the big data also blurs the boundary between teaching and research in education. In other words, when we use this data, we can start figuring out what questions to ask in terms of research. This is an example of what I mean by big data. We are looking at a student's ID. We have been asking them while they're on the system, are you excited? Are you interested? Can you explain why you're excited? This person said, I'm interested. And, and then he or she typed, uh, it's OK. And then this person said, I'm excited. And then he, he or she typed, because I actually am feeling as though I'm learning, because math is my favorite subject. Uh, I am kind of excited because I am provided a lot of tools that can help me. I have been doing better too. And then someone else says, this is too hard. And it's too hard. When people want to learn, they want to at least have fun while learning. So this is not doing, giving me enough fun. It is interesting solving new problems. I am not feeling excited because math is not fun, et cetera. OK, so we have all these. Kids are typing it in because we asked them. Are you interested? Are you excited? And then we ask them to type in what the reason is. And we can evaluate this because we can do natural language processing. And we can do it at the same moment that we have a record of what they have been doing. In other words, did they solve a lot of problems correctly on first? Are they just guessing? Are they just clicking and going through problems? Or are they asking for all the hints so that they could get hints and maybe get the answers? And this is, again, more data. But let's see what the reason here. And this is also, on, it's the same system, so it's the same kind of data. So we have gigabytes of data like this. And we're showing also that they're on to the next problem. They're beginning a new problem. They're beginning to read text, uh, et cetera. They begin drawing. And then we have a few other things, like when they, the time lapse and how many problems they asked for, and some more of the same their excitement, their statements, 
et cetera. So you can get the picture that we're talking, uh, there's actually time stamps, so we're at four, I don't know. But we're talking uh, seconds going by, these are seconds. Uh, when they gave these messages, et cetera, when they started, when they rounded. So we're talking every second we can detect what their mood is and what they're, what they're doing. So it's, again, not like you wait till the end of a chapter or you wait till the end of the semester and you give a, an exam. But we're figuring this out every second while the child is working, and this can go on for weeks. And then here's some more, I'm not sure. Because I'm good at math, but it isn't really fun for me. Um, most make sense, but some don't, et cetera. So we can take these messages and try to coordinate them with the mood that the child is in and then see if we can do an intervention, like ask them to collaborate and see if that does anything for them. This is the same thing. This is also educational data, but it's visual data. And it's people solving problems. I don't know if you've heard of code.org. So it's a system where there's code given out. It's actually one day a year, millions of children are using it, actually one million users. And all they're doing is solving incredibly simple problems. They're writing five lines of code. And this visual data shows that the zero is the f complete correct answer. The answer that these kids got is are two steps away. The answer these kids got are one, is one step away if they did it that way. The answers that these kids got are 10 steps away. In other words, we can actually give a million children exams about solving math problems, and then we can make visual graphics of uh, how far away they are from the correct solution and what kind of solution they have to get to actually correct it. And it's about learning policy. So this is a field called educational data mining, or it's called learning at scale. And the question is now, now that we have millions of students working together and we have all this data, how can we analyze it? And this is a very nice visual way to, to look at it. The correct answer is here. No, uh, no, each node is a unique partial solution. The arc is the next solution that an expert would recommend. And I, I didn't tell you, but it's a graduate student from Stanford who did this work. Okay, so the goal is to identify mechanisms and infrastructures to support analysis of educational data. This is where the miracle is going to happen. People say AI is the future of education. I believe it's going to happen in this area. We can analyze student behavior quickly and in real time. And this information supports teachers. So if a teacher also has this information, they can offer help. They can change course material or complement the student. They can interact with the student better if they see that material. But if they see the forms that I just showed you, they would turn away in horror because nobody can read those forms. So educators need to be able to monitor each student personally, but they have to see this uh, uh, big data in a better format. But what we're looking at now is how to answer teachers' questions from an educational data. What do they want to know? What do researchers in learning science want to know? And so we've been asking questions, and we've been asking them, what do you want to know while students spend an hour or 45 minutes doing math problems? So we've gotten these kind of answers. They want to know how much the student knows, where are their gaps, uh, are, are they acting and are we teaching effectively? How have the students become effective learners? Self-regulation machines, if they know they're doing something wrong, what do they do about it? And we can actually start reading that in this data. Students' motivation questions and technical effectiveness and engagement questions. Uh, teachers have also told us they want to know who my students are at the beginning of the year and what they, who they are in the middle of the year and who they are at the end of the year. Which basic concepts and why have my students had a hard time retaining? How can we use data to detect students, group clusters with different levels of understanding? I'm not going to go into it, but this is where you use machine learning and you cluster students to put them in categories to figure out how they're performing. And how do we measure conceptual understanding? Lucky, was that a lucky guess, or do they really have true knowledge? And this is the last screen of teachers. Comments. Given individual student gaps, how can I best fill the gaps, support individual students, forgotten concepts? How can we use data to inform change curriculum content? And how can we use data to inform the curriculum and sequencing within learning software? So we are working with teachers. They are providing these questions. And we're going back to the data to see if we can find ways to do data mining and answer their questions. I don't know if you all, some of you are teachers, do you have the same questions? Would you like to know that kind of in an hourly basis as opposed to end of the semester? So these are the kind of systems we're outputting to teachers, and it's not ideal yet, 
but we're working on getting it better. So I, I know the picture is not as good as it ought to be, but we are showing teachers in blue all the pro times this student, this is for one student, it's a weak student we've decided, and number of problems he solved, which is one problem. For this problem and this student, he skipped this many problems. He didn't, he gave up. That's purple, I don't see it. On these many problems, he solved on first on this one. That is, this is, this is the problem he solved on first. He did, he actually attempted some problems. He guessed on this problem. He gave hints and he got help, etc. In other words, the system makes these assumptions or inferences about the student and puts it out to the teacher, which is kind of nice. And similarly here, again, I don't think you can see it very well, but it lists every, the user's name, uh, the, this is angles and triangles and Pythagorean theorem, and for each problem it says, the system says what it thinks the student has, was doing in terms of skipping. It doesn't say right or wrong, it does say whether, what behavior the student had. And then it, the system also puts out for the teacher, uh, this is a mastery list. This is the number of problems, and he, the mastery was pretty low, but then he kept doing all problems of the same topic, and I think this is Pythagorean theorem, and then he started to really master it. Okay, so the teacher gets that as often as they want, these listings, et cetera, and a report per problem, et cetera. Okay, so you get an idea of what is possible. And let me, the last thing is to talk about the perils of AI in education. And what I mean by that is the, there's a lot of ethics that we have not handled, we have not addressed. The ethics are to start asking questions like who benefits and under what conditions. This is all information about students, but yet the students and the parents have not, well they give permission for this because we can't go into the classroom unless they give permission, but do they know what's happening with their data? There's a case, I don't know how many people know about InBloom, who've heard about a company that just went out of business a year ago because they claimed they had all this data and they were going to sell it to companies that were going to provide teaching material, sell teaching material to parents, right? And that's not a very good idea. So our, but our question is, what can we do with this data? And what should we do? And how are we protecting it? Who has access to this data analysis after we analyze it? So we have to define the moral and ethical virtues for super intelligent AI. As AI gets more advanced, we think there's going to be more super intelligence AI in education. And how should this analysis be measured and implemented and what qualifies as ethical education technology, et cetera? And what if the, you go into the classroom and the system doesn't work or doesn't work the way it's supposed to? And that happens a lot, of course. Uh, why should teachers be stuck with it? What do we do about that? And then just a few more items about that. So we need policies in place for the ethical use and protection of this data. Who owns it? Again, the parents should own it, or the children should own it, but they don't. It's usually the superintendent or the principal who will go and say, okay, take this data, use it at a state level so I can prove I'm doing something. But then people possibly can find out about children and their activities. Uh, can data be ported among schools and institutions? Can you move it all to the superintendent level? And can anyone control the secondary use of this data by researchers? Etc. and who gives informed consent and guarantees and privacies and who classifies it and manages it. So until now, it's pretty clear that schools are not expecting this data to be doing what I'm suggesting here. And very few schools have people in security watching this they, or people in confidentiality or privacy managing this. Very few schools have IT people handling this kind of thing. And I, I think it's about time we do it now so that we can control it. You talked about the market controlling it. I'm afraid the data might control what happens, and I think that's a little scary. Um, okay, so I'm pretty much done. And uh, the last thing, I, I did not know that you were coming. I wanted to talk about XPRIZE, because I, I think it's the most magnificent thing. So it's exactly the same thing, right? <laughs> I, I did get that from your webpage. Okay, and that's it. Any questions?